Okay, colleagues, I'm supposed to do something with blues. Now, Raj did something that would be what you'll be doing, that is developing multiple choice items, which is one of the types of tests that you can do. And when I look at what I'm supposed to do, I try to put three pieces together that came out of blues, or the work done by blues, that has come down to us in the past 50 odd years. Now before we can start anything, we should look at some terms that we bandy about or as teachers, we hear about them and we should know before we go anything into education that we should know something about them. And these are educational goals, general objectives, specific objectives, people's performance. Those of you who have looked at the CXC syllabus would have seen all CXC syllabuses would have had a series of objectives, be it general, specific, and of course we look at people's performance. What is that? Now, of course, educational goal, just a general aim or purpose. Exactly what is it you're trying to do? Long range or come to work towards, and an example, develop proficiency in the basic skills of reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's a goal. And your goal is for your class, or for your lecture, or for the course that you're doing. The university will have its goal. The department that you're in will have its goal, but you can have a goal too. What you want to achieve in this particular subject that you're teaching. So it's not something that you can just think in terms of, oh, the university has a goal, so I don't have to have one. Because your goal is, okay, I've done a university, I've given a class, I've given a course, what is it I'm trying to achieve in this particular course? And of course, the general objective will be in terms of goal instruction, that has been stated in a general term. Now, here is the goal. The general objectives come from out of your goal. And then we look at what we call specific objective. This is the one. And this came out of the work of Blooms. And I'll say a little bit more when we get to that stage. The specific objective is the intended outcome of instruction that has been stated in terms of observable pupil performance. And that came also from people like Skinner and all those people in behavioral psychology, where they said the only way you can know if somebody do something is if you see them doing it. <laughs> Previously, we spoke about somebody understanding or some, using some of those words. Those guys come up and you'll hear a little bit more about that. That the only way, the only time you can say somebody has learned is if you see them doing what you expect them to do. It must be something that you can see observable. And of course, people performance, any measurable or observable people response. And of course, I'm using pupil here to mean students because pupil is more or less related to our primary school. But what I'm thinking about is students. And a measurable or observable people response in the cognitive effect of psychomotor. We learn a little bit more about those three. Now, objectives, and how do you select them? There's a criteria for selecting appropriate objectives. Now, you will have, let's say you've just joined the university, your head of department will give you a, a course of plan, and on this course of plan we'll have, well of course you need to speak about specific objectives, you'll see some specific objectives, but that person will have developed that course of line should have taken into consideration that those objectives include all important outcomes, meaning this thing that we're trying to teach students, these are objectives that we select really and truly, you know, include the important outcomes that we need to teach. Because we can select all types of outcomes for any subject matter. But then we, in terms of what we're supposed to be doing, 
these objectives that you've seen and that course of line. And I'm speaking now about the person who is designing that course of line. Do the objectives include all the important outcomes that students should know who is doing this particular course? And that is about completeness. Are the objectives in harmony with the general goals of the university, the class, the department, whatever the case may be? You see how difficult it comes from? When to select an objective for your course or your program, and that would be appropriateness. Are you objective in harmony with some principles of learning? What are the principles of learning that we know about? Of course, we go to school, and those mathematics teachers, I'd like to use this example. You teach a topic or teach a concept, and then you go to the back of the book, and the mathematics book got about 20 items, and you want 20 different problems in the back, and you allow students to do all 20. What are you trying to do? Some principles of learning say that if you practice, you become profit. If you practice, you become the habit. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. Of course, they will do it when they give you 20, <laughs> 20 problems or more. They just try to make you perfect in that concept. And some principles of learning speaks about practice. If you practice, you become a bit of just like smoking. And smoke is a bad example. <laughs> Our objective realistic in terms of people's strength, ability, and the time and facilities available. Okay. I, I, I just want to go back and say what you want. I just want to go back to the point about the objective and how to make Right. Um, I wanted to go back to the top point. Are the objectives in harmony with some principles of learning? And for me, I, I'm familiar with Bloom's taxonomy of learning. Um, some principles of learning for me wouldn't include quantity, as the example that you gave just now with the number of you know, uh, exercises or whatever the students give. I, I guess I'm a bit confused okay. it, it sounded like you were using yeah. quantity versus... No, what I was trying to do is illustrate that these teachers were trying to give the students as much practice as possible because of the other the practice they perfect. Okay. And I'm saying that is not, not, yeah. that is not what's supposed to happen. Right. Okay. right? Some principles of learning, yes, say that you must be tutored and you must do things over and over so that you can become perfect in that concept. But then as I said, our colleagues sometimes go overboard in terms of how much work they need to make you perfect. That, that's how I was saying. Some principles of learning, and there are many principles of learning. And quickly, we know in, we don't put so much in university, but at the primary schools, I would like to use an example. Nursery teachers will give you gold stars. They love gold stars, they love silver stars. It means that when you have gold stars, and this is a case of reward, you want to always get a gold star, so you'll always do the things that give you a gold star. When you have a, a silver star, which is less than a gold star, you want to work towards, and those are the things that, those are principles of learning. It comes up with principles of learning that you want to go on to the next level, the reward. Okay, yes. Now we come to Bloom's. Now this guy, since 1956, and those of you who know about it, created a revolution in education at that time. Because this is the first time he was saying, you know what? We are testing students and just using some basic things like remembering and knowledge and so forth. We are not really challenging our students. You know, when Bloom's came up with this, you know, it really, really revolutionized, as I said. All the teachers college through out through all the things that they were doing to move into what he said. Now he spoke about the cognitive domain, and of course he wrote about the effective domain and the psychometric domain, but he didn't do anything about it because he was just interested in the cognitive domain. And even though this still 1964, Dr. Bloom said, okay, I have developed the cognitive domain, I've thrown that out, I've referenced it. At this I don't know if he intended to do that, but he has revolutionized teaching and learning. 
But these two other areas, although he mentioned them, he didn't know anything about them. And this guy, Pratol, a colleague, he came up and he did the food. Developed the effective for me, and in 72, since we developed the psychomotor domain. We all know that the effective domain has to do with values and so forth. The psychomotor has to do with performance. It tells you exactly how you start the performance and end performance. How you come very good in a performance. But today's lecture is about the cognitive domain. Now, when Bloom's company, in 1956, this cognitive hierarchy of knowing, look at knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. And what he was saying, that's what I mentioned, he said most of our tests, and the did studies like that, show that our tests, most of the items in our tests, look at knowledge and comprehension and a little bit of application. And he's saying, we are not challenging our students. Because we can move it three notches higher with analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. And what I can tell you, that start, that started a series of problems. Well, we call it a problem. Because we started getting into, by the 60s, we started getting into accountability. We started telling people the right objectives, students would be able to which we never did before. It also said the teachers will be able to. You know? And he came out and said, no teachers in this thing. And what the students can do with the thoroughly of their learning. And now what the teacher is doing. And of course, you know, those of you who have read a little bit about that, we know that that caused serious problems. Some teachers say, under no circumstances I'm going to write, students will be able to. And we have different versions of what it can be to satisfy. But as I said, it started a whole host of problems in teaching. All teachers, colleges all over the place changed to the cloud now and it actually showed you how you can do it. Having questions or items in our test that will test all six. We're not saying you should have knowledge and comprehension, but that should not be the only type of objective that we're having. Again, coming back to your course of playing. When you're making that, you want to make sure that you sample all of these in your course of playing. Of course, you might have more knowledge, and, but it means that you would not have left out evaluation, synthesis, analysis. Of course, in the primary school, I think they just use the course three, knowledge, comprehension, and application. But, as I said, Bloom said, this is not good enough. And from since then, much effort has been made to look. Well, that was now from 56 to growing the waves until in 2001, Pratal, who was a colleague of, of Bloom, and one of Bloom's students, and I must say Bloom was a guy from Harvard University, and most of the major work that came out of Harvard University has revolutionized what we do in education. They came up and said, okay, from a lot of, quite a lot of studies that were done, that this thing, instead of nouns, it should be words. You might be seeing them in remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating. And they gave some ideas on how this is supposed to be done. For remembering, it's to recall information and exhibit the memory or previously learned material. I remember a point of blue, these are the bottom of the taxonomy. Information and knowledge could be facts, stars, basic concept. And one of the things that came out of this too, a whole industry in creating boards to suit these levels, you know, became in force. Because when you write an objective, you want something in the, let's say in the applying or or one of the higher order, you can go and find a board because that's the important thing. I remember CFC. Because you want to have this full range, you're always looking for a board. Because your board identify what level. And you can identify from any syllabus too, from the boards being used, from this action word being used, exactly which of these levels 
that objective is supposed to be. So it helps, as I said, the whole of history. Show me history of all. So, a plethora of objectives and worlds. If you go on the internet, you can find all sorts. And I'll leave a set that you can use to do your. So, the art of memory is an understanding of the strict understanding of facts and ideas. By organizing, comparing, translating, interpreting, giving description, and stating the main idea, it tells you exactly what should happen in a particular objective. Applying new information in new or familiar situations to resolve problems by using the acquired facts, knowledge, rules, and so it helps. If you read these, it helps you in putting these things together exactly what this objective should be all about. Analyzing, examining, and slicing information into portions. They are assigning causes of motive, make inferences, and find evidence to support generalization. Evaluating expressive and fair opinions, judgment for information, authenticity of ideas, or work quality according to certain criteria. Creating, organize, integrate, and utilize the concept into a plan, product, or proposal that is new. Compile information together in a different way. Well, in a university, we can use all six of them. There's no reason in primary school, as I said, it involves application or applying. But in university, at university level, all six of them can be used. And as I said, there's a series of words, and this was generated as a, a slide that I can send to you. When you, all you have to do nowadays is just one of particular type of this, and you look to see what are the words available. And I said, CXC, I always be looking for words. At that time, they didn't have something and then everybody put it on the set of words. So, but remember, you have a set of words that you can use, so if you know when you write your objective with a, one of these words, of course, you'll have some words interchange, you can find them in more than one. But then there's enough that you can identify individuals to help you with your work. Okay, that's the first part. You understand about blooms now? and the type of work that you did, and the type of work that you have to say you were revolutionized, education, all to just kind of get through everything that they were doing, and introduced in terms of training teachers, how to write objectives, how to, now you have to use the skill to construct to do test construction. Classroom tests play a central role in the evaluation of students' learning. They provide relevant measures of many important learning outcomes and indirect evidence concerning others. So it tells you about weaknesses of the student. It also tells you other things that maybe you didn't think about. And maybe coming back to that diagnostic bit. From your test, you realize something is going on, students, especially in mathematics. They are making some simple mistakes. Why? That's when diagnostics come in to tell you exactly where that. You know, weary problem lines. So the validity of the information they provide all depends on the care that goes into planning and preparation of the test. So the test can tell you all sorts of things. But before it can tell you all sorts of things, there are certain things that you must do before it can tell you these things that you're supposed to be told about. Okay, the first thing is not the purpose of the test. Something as simple as that. Why are you doing this test? Is it a test or an answer test? Is it a summative test? These are all terms in here. Is it a formative test? And I think I'll be so far to decide that it's a little bit more than that. So, determine the purpose of testing. Develop the test or table specification. And the last part I'm supposed to try to do it, show you a little bit of that. So, select items. You just went through one of the charts. After you have determined the of the test, you have done the table specification, now you select the type of item. And it can be true or false, the multiple charge matches, because you must decide exactly if this will be a combination of a set or if it is just one type. And prepare relevant test items using Bloom's Academy and we look at that.
right, so we're looking at the overview, test preparation. There's so many things that you have to do. Purpose of the testing, what type of test? Is it a formative? Is it just to give you some information as to how much your students know? Is it summative? That is, I'm going to take a mark from this test to put on your records. Is it diagnostic? Is it a problem you're trying to diagnose? So, the relevant test items, items related to different levels of cognitive functioning. What is levels of cognitive functioning? They're speaking about group taxonomies. Remembering, understanding. It means that your test will have all these levels before it can be a true test. And of course, assembly tests are ways to test, appraise the test, and we look at this bit of all of that. Classic tests can be used for a variety of instructional purposes. These tests are not evaluation, quick and got better, four types. Classic evaluation, placement, formative, diagnostic, summative. Of course, our most placement is the one that you do at, at grade six level. Where all the students in the country will do that test, and from their results, we put them into a particular secondary school. Of course, we're not doing that unless you in your school, in the day one, two, three. Well, it's not a promotional test, because a promotional test will be a summative type of test. So, placement is the typical and the government does, and I don't, I don't know how many of you would have to do that, where from the results, you put students into a particular type of school, be it Queen's College, be it a primary top of a secondary school. Formative, if you're trying to find out something about the students, how much have they learned today? This, they will have a, they will have a mark they would have received, doesn't go anywhere, it's just guidance to you in terms of how much they have grasped at this time. Diagnostic, as I mentioned, a particular problem. It, I always think about long division. You know, in doing long division, Students always have problems, and let's say your students is continuous after problems with doing on vision. You can set up some problems to see exactly where that student is going around. Remember, you used to talk about working as a kid to see what they're working. They're looking at the working to see exactly what the student is doing, and from the working, you can determine, hey, this is where you're wrong, you're going around, and you pick that up and you use it in your lesson the next time around. I don't know how much of this is done at the university level. But let's just explain that concept. Summative is our midterm test, our end of kind of term test, because those test results go on the record. So that's called summative. Test table specification, and this is very important. And this is something that I'm hoping if I don't know. Give me some time to go through some of these. Because if you don't have a proper table specification, you cannot have a proper test. And most of our, well, as a university level, people say, okay, why do that in primary school? But that is where you can determine if your test is really testing all the objectives or most of the objectives in your course of learning. Very relevant items, items related to different levels of cognitive functioning. I remember they use that nice term cognitive functioning. I'm speaking about remembering, it must sample those areas. And this is a note, I put it in italics because I'm saying it's really. As noted previously, construction of items or classroom tests to be preceded by a series of preliminary steps. First, the purpose of the test will be determined. What type of test? Is it a diagnostic? Is it something that the students' scores will be recorded? First, the purpose of the test will be determined. Second, a set of specifications should be developed. You see how important that is? Third, the most important item types should be selected. The most important item types. This come into both Rajiv's work. Finally, the test items should be constructed in accordance with the table of specification developed. And that's why I want to go a little bit about that. Now, in terms of assembling the test, you know, people are thinking of being, especially ones with choice. And I made a point. 
Hier wollen wir gleich das erste Gaulis-Faktor tun, die sind vielleicht in die Vorsicht. Das ist ja die Vorsicht, die ich habe. Wie wir sehen, die Vorsicht sind alle Studenten in der anderen Welt. Wenn wir von 11, 12 und 16 Jahren reden, wir reden von 30 bis 40 Jahren, dann ist es die Vorsicht, die wir von der Vorsicht sind. Wir reden von der Vorsicht, die wir von der Vorsicht sind. Wir reden von der Vorsicht, die wir von der Vorsicht sind. Sheep from the goats. We <laughs> said, well, none of them nice what you use. But that's why it's a great those who are really studying the work. And therefore, in terms of the assembling, and we don't have time, there's another bit of work that you got to learn how you assemble. And what Rad spoke about it. In item analysis, you know, item analysis, you're able to determine which of your items are easy, which are difficult. And, and because of the index that you have, you can number them from one. To 40. That's another thing. Administer the test. And this is important. Let me give you an example. The first thing, first test I did at UG. I won't say which group, and this is about 200 and something students. When I picked up the paper in Margaret, about 90% of the students got an E. Okay. The other part is, uh, I want to know. <laughs> from my CHB, what is going on here? Are these students so bright? <laughs> when, I go to the end, when I go to the end of the park, he said, he said, you had something going on here. What is it? And then, about two months after, about two months after, he says, well, oh, I know you do. Because I'm not cheating and not here, you know. <laughs> students are passing people. And then I realized that when you have such large classes, you're supposed to have a mediator. Maybe my naivety. <laughs> so, you know, that test, and I got a regular mark, you have about 40 something years, and some of these, which look, as I said, you have a part of the which look as what the university expects. <laughs> so, I'm thinking about administrative tests. That's important. In administrative tests, you gotta make sure, and that's why the people put, in my time in school, they used to put a boy and a girl. Meaning that boys will not copy from girls. <laughs> no, that was it. That was it at that time. No, the girls are thinking about it. It was a test by girl, by girl. You know, as an adult, they said, what? It means that under no circumstances you look in a girl paper. <laughs> that, that's how we win when we explain it. No, I said, I'm going to test that you must put procedures in place to make sure that the test is properly done and everybody is, is our own work and therefore you know, the results here are a true performance of the students. So don't ignore it. I did and they did it mad. So that's a the test. That's also so important. You have done the test, you've got a paper spot, and typical of all of us we put it in a drop because we copy the marks, send it up to the university, exam division, and we put the papers. Now those papers have valuable information that can tell you exactly what can be done for the next class, especially with the final paper. It can tell you exactly the progress of the student during that semester, and therefore the new set of students coming, you can plan. Because you saw some of the weaknesses in the example, or you do the example, you just put it in the top, and that's where it's supposed to be. But a present test also includes, well, unless it's a midterm, you know, discuss with students some of the, because the exam, the final exam, there's no way you see them again. But for a midterm test, you can appraise it in terms of looking and telling them exactly how they did and so forth. But a present test is an important step because it guides you about all the concepts your students want to grasp and maybe you can plan for the next class that is coming. If it is a midterm, you can plan for the after the midterm test. If it's a final test, you can plan, as I just said, for the next class. Use the results. Meaning, you have seen what has happened. You know where the weaknesses of your students lie, be it midterm or end of year, and therefore you plan to remedy that either in the next class or in the balance of the term after the term. Good, the table specification, I'm glad that they got here. How much time do I have? Oh, 
Okay, you can go through that. Building a table specifically includes one, obtaining a list of instructional objectives, outlining the course content, and preparing it to a channel. So, you must have your instructional objectives, you all must have the course content, because if you have, those of you have looked at the CXC syllabus, you see they have the content, then they have the objectives, be it specific, be it general specific objectives. I mean, the specific objectives we'll be using to make the table specification. Okay, I must mention the thing that you do in class, that's paper and pencil test. That's the name. You call it to uh, differentiate from other type of tests like what the ministry does with my dear good standardized test. So paper and pencil test is what we call that thing that we do. So you have a question, let's get to us. Give this slide, set of slides so it can be passed on to you. Now, what, this is what they're speaking about. I'm using here for the content, that's the content of your course, your course outline. And on the column side, you have the different level of, the level of cognitive. So you have remembering what this is saying. When you look at your objectives, I remember I told you, you can use the verb to identify which. So let's say the first bit of content there. When you look at the verb, the objectives, and see actually we have 50, 60 objectives. I don't think you're so going to have that many. They can determine that there are two objectives to remembering. There's one for understanding the street of flying, there's one for analyzing, and two evaluating. We didn't have any for creating. So you can, depending on what the level of cognitive functions that you have, you can determine that would be the column area of your, and then in the, in the, the column area, and then you have the other part of the content. So you can set up it. You don't have to, all you have to do is look at the objectives that you have for each bit of content. I don't know if it was outlined is like that, where it tells you, this objective is to this particular content. Mm -hmm. So there you can have, let's say in this table, there are 12 remembering objectives, which will be 24%, 9, 18%, understanding, applying, 13, analyzing, 8, evaluating, 8. Now, as I said, it depends on the type of course that you do. If it will go right across the six level of and then so this tells you that you don't have, what the guy was saying is that all of these, in this area, you saw the majority, maybe up to 60% of our objectives. And it doesn't have to be like that. It can be, the important thing is that you have objectives that measure the high order learning objectives. Means and if you don't want, as I said, the only way you can, you can look at it is if you look at the verbs. If you familiarize yourself with which verb is for which one, you can identify them and pick them up and put them into this format. And, and most times you'll find that you're not covering everything. You as a lecturer, there's no reason why you can bring in an objective from the content that you have before you that can cover all of this. So, we find that in this one we have 24, 32, 24, 34, we need 42 percent in the lower order, and the rest in the higher order. That looks good. Rather than having 60 percent in one, the lower order, and 42. Yeah, and at the worst level, yeah, you can do that. You should be able to have more higher order of the I'm curious. Um we have the first year, and then we have the third and the fourth year. Yes. I'm not uh, neglecting second. But when you are making the jump from secondary to university, 
what should this table look like? Should we cater more for the lower order at the first year level? And uh, it should look a little more different when we get to third and final where we cater more for the higher order? Yeah, I I'm like just that. curious. I like, I like that arrangement because, yes, you're, this is your subject area. And let's say if you're fortunate enough to be teaching it at all levels, do we have that? That somebody who teaches something first year, second year, third year? But I agree with you, let's say at the first year level, you can put more emphasis in conscientiousness and the lower order, but it's not to be the majority. Because when you get to graduation year, you want to make sure that you most of your objectives are in here, you know? But so I'm not going to tell you that you know, so much the same. You'll have to look at your work and, and say, well, okay, you're an expert in what you teach. You say, okay, at this level, maybe I should emphasize, but I always try to make sure that you cover before, if it's one or two. So that's one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the idea of putting emphasis on different um, levels of the assessment, the cognitive function in year one and so on. I think that depends on what you're teaching in the area of study. For example, I teach law, and you are required to know at the highest level from year one. Because I mean, it, you know, we don't do. Um, criminal law 101 and then criminal law 2, criminal law 1 and 2. We, we do have criminal law 1 and 2, but one doesn't build on the other, right? It's just, um, okay, I've covered this one, I've covered rape and death and so on, and Good in here I'm going to cover murder. Yeah. And you have to do it all. Meaning that you have to, I'm not saying that you should not have anything that you never understand it, but you know in your law, this is the full course that you do in this area, Therefore, you should be keeping your guys a little quickly, right? Um, one of the things that um, I realized um, because I'm new if you may at um, this whole teaching thing yeah, yeah. right I'm, I'm new to it um, one of the problems that I had when I when I started because you know I would give um, students a test and testing all of these um, different areas but then I realized that there are times when I wasn't actually during the teaching learning session and not giving the students the opportunity to to sort of explore, have a feel of all of these um, things. So I'm expecting them at the end to know, but then uh, from the beginning, I'm not giving them the opportunity to create, or I'm not giving them the opportunity to analyze. And I think that is something uh, that is important during the, the actual teaching learning session, that we incorporate these things so that at the end, it's not something new to um, the students. That's what Bloom's discovered in 1966 that we start, uh, we start changing our students. We are narrating their knowledge and their ability by just giving them. You try, you have a lot of questions and see how they come up, and you may surprise yourself that one or two of them rise to that level. Okay, that's yeah. awesome. Sir, I just, I, yeah, okay. just had another uh, contribution. I teach in architecture. And our, we have courses from the first year all the way to the final year, which is five years, and we expect the students to be at a certain level as they progress from year to year to year. The problem, when I looked at the curriculum for the entire, nothing like this has been produced before, I decided to take it upon myself to take the course outlines for each year, each semester, for that particular course, and develop a matrix to see exactly what the learning objectives were for each year. And when I did that, it made no sense whatsoever. I'm not so students, I, I have students in third year who should have learned basic things and be able to be at a certain level of learning. 
at, you know, third year, they should have learned this in the first and second year, but they haven't. Because the curriculum is not cohesive, it's not been well thought out. That's a typical teacher's problem. That's a young situation. But yeah, you're supposed to have done this in the year before. Okay. Just quickly, thanks for that. But that one, thanks for that. But particularly to emphasize the importance, the importance of conferencing between colleagues when they are among colleagues when they are developing a curricular program. Because we don't have a sense. Sometimes you are operating at year three or four, and your colleagues are operating at a different level of cognitive challenge. And so you look bad. Uh, so the reality is that there is that need. Mm -hmm. I think this is what this is raising. But it's not my right. Yeah, you see, all these are things that came up when the group came up with this thing. You can't have a five-year program where individuals teach year one, year two, year three, or four, or five, and there's no, you know, coordination to know that what is done in year one facilitates what is done in year two, and it goes up to five. And all these are things that came up. So I suppose again, the bees are going to go back and sit with the people and be sitting. Anybody else? Okay, this, this is, this is a, a third grade, and it just, just helps to show exactly. This is a social studies, you have food, clothing, those are the content areas. And this is what is expected to be learned by those that would be covered. And each objective is placed where it's supposed to be in terms of the chart. And therefore, you have, in this case, the people qualified, nearly to five percent of the understanding, because that's a, at that level, it's more understanding, knowledge, and understanding as opposed to the application. So in a third grade, as I said, there's nothing is wrong with having a majority because at that level, that's what they're trying to bring with the students. But as they go on to higher grades, the number of objectives in the understanding and knowledge which are reduced considerably as they get up to school leaving or whatever they call it. But this is just another way of showing and the third one, this is if you have a syllabus or course of length of science. In this case, people can still test. It's not the only type of test you have in science. You have skill test. We're using measuring devices, in this case, constructing measuring devices. That's in terms of science, the type of thing that students. What they're saying, your table of specification is divided in two. Your practical aspect is 50%, and then you go, the other part goes through the knowledge, understanding, and interpretation. So for science, it doesn't have to be that you leave up your practical, because that's an important aspect, but it is putting your table of specification as requiring 50% of the marks, and the other part, the theoretical part, will be 50%. So your table of specifications can take care of that also. And again, you use the same thing where you put your content area, 